In my last video on Quine's objections to modal logic, I explored how Quine prefers extensional logical systems and is uneasy about intentional ones. In this video, I want to examine a particular failure of extensionality that, according to Quine, spells trouble. Now, because this gets quite subtle, I want us to recall what the problem was last time. Uh, we saw how, in standard logic, all that matters to the truth value of any complex sentence is the truth value of its parts. All that matters to the truth value of, say, A and B is the truth value of A and the truth value of B. That's it. Nothing else matters. So that's a feature that will be shared by any extensional system. However, if we take a modal sentence, necessarily A, well, this depends on more than just the truth value of A. And you only need to consider the sentences 1 plus 1 equals 2 and Frank Zappa was a musician to see this. Necessarily 1 plus 1 equals 2 is true. Necessarily Frank Zappa was a musician is false. Uh, so that's one way in which extensionality fails in modal logics. But extensionality fails in other ways too. Uh, you see this, I, I guess you could think of it as a, a failure at the level of full sentences. We're just putting a we're just putting a necessity operator in front of a full sentence and extensionality is failing. But extensionality also fails at the level of uh, descriptions and names. And we'll see what I mean as we, we go through the video. Right, so let's think about identity. According to Quine, a fundamental principle of identity is substitutivity, or as he calls it, the indiscernibility of identicals. Um, the idea being that if, if two things are identical, then they should be indiscernible. And the motivation for this probably quite obvious idea is uh, a, an equally obvious observation, that if two things are identical, then whatever is true of one of them must be true of the other. Uh, if they differed in any respect, then they wouldn't be identical, right? So, if we have two terms that name the same thing, and we have a true sentence containing one of those terms, well, we should be able to substitute one term for the other, and the resulting sentence will still be true. Wouldn't, we, we shouldn't be able to affect the truth value of our sentence. Right, so, so suppose, for example, we say that Bob Dylan is Robert Zimmerman. Uh, so Bob Dylan equals Robert Zimmerman. This is a true statement of identity. Robert Zimmerman is, for those who don't know, simply another name for Bob Dylan. Right, the idea of substitutivity is that if we have some sentence containing the name Bob Dylan, we should be able to substitute in the name Robert Zimmerman for Bob Dylan without changing the truth value of the sentence. Uh, and it, it, it's just that's just an expression of the perfectly commonsensical idea that if Bob Dylan is Robert Zimmerman, then whatever is true of Bob Dylan is true of Robert Zimmerman. Whatever is false of Bob Dylan is false of Robert Zimmerman. So it's and vice versa, obviously. So you know it's it's a fairly simple simple idea. Uh, but it's actually very easy to find counterexamples to this principle. Consider the following sentences. Bob Dylan contains less than nine letters. Robert Zimmerman contains less than nine letters. Consider these ones. Frank believes that Bob Dylan is a famous musician. Frank believes that Robert Zimmerman is a famous musician. Right. One is true, two is false. It's possible for three to be true and four to be false, and vice versa. We can imagine that uh, Frank has has heard of Bob Dylan but has never even heard the name Robert Zimmerman. So we've we we have two think two things that are identical. Bob Bob Dylan is Robert Zimmerman, and yet we've just substituted the names and changed the truth value of the sentence. Uh, we've got perhaps some sort of paradox. What's happened here? Well, for one and two, we have to bear in mind the quotation marks around the names. The quotation marks there. Recall the first video in this uh, series. Um, or was it the second? I think it was the second, actually, where I discussed use and mention. Well, in uh, one, Bob Dylan's name is being mentioned, not used. One isn't actually about Bob Dylan. It's about Bob Dylan's name. And similarly, two, 
that's not about Robert Zimmerman. That's about the name Robert Zimmerman. Now, Bob Dylan may well be identical to Robert Zimmerman, but obviously each name isn't identical to the other. They're completely different names, and that's why substitutivity fails. Um, Quine points out that in the case of 1 and 2, making this kind of substitution is as defensible as substituting upon the term cat in cattle. Uh, because in sentence one here, the name Bob Dylan occurs merely as part of a longer name which consists of those letters plus the quotation marks. Um, Bob Dylan plus the quotation marks doesn't refer to the same thing as just Bob Dylan. What about three and four? Well, these are a bit trickier and have actually generated quite a lot of literature. Um, but suffice it to say uh, that they're as much about Frank's beliefs as they are about Bob Dylan. Um, when we use constructions such as believes that, uh, or knows that, says that, has heard that, is unaware that, and so on, when we use constructions like that, the names and descriptions within them no longer refer purely to the objects, but they're also dependent uh, on how some person thinks about those objects, or whatever, how some person relates to those objects. So we can consider that we might, we could uh, rephrase three as Frank believes Bob Dylan is a famous musician, in quotation marks. And in this case, it's obvious why we can't substitute, because Bob Dylan is a famous musician, just isn't, it's not the same belief as Robert Zimmerman is a famous musician, in the same, in the same sense as we had with quotation in one and two. So, what can we say about this? Well, the failure of substitutivity reveals that, in these contexts, the names are not being used in a purely referential way. The truth of the sentence depends not on the object, but on how we name the object. So, the truth value of Frank believes that Bob Dylan is a famous musician depends not on Bob Dylan himself, but on how we name Bob Dylan. Quine describes the contexts introduced by quotation and by constructions such as believe that as referentially opaque. So this is referential opacity. Referential opacity obtains when substitutivity of identicals fails to hold. And it's, it, it's because the expressions are no longer being used purely referentially that the substitutivity of identicals fails. Now it turns out that modal operators also introduce opaque contexts. And here is a, a classic example. The number of planets is 8. 8 is equal to the number of planets. So now consider this rather simple argument. Necessarily 8 is greater than 5, 8 is the number of planets, therefore necessarily the number of planets is greater than 5. The conclusion to this argument is false, obviously, um, and this very clearly demonstrates the opacity introduced by modal operators. Um, in this context, what does the number of planets refer to? What does 8 refer to? Uh, now, in the case of quotation and belief, we found ways to explain the problem. Can similar explanations be offered here? Uh, well, it depends very much on how we interpret the modal operator in question, and that's what we'll turn to in the next video. Um, but before ending this video, uh, I want to consider one move you might make in response to, to 6. You might simply uh, bite the bullet and say, actually, the conclusion is true. The number of planets is greater than 5. After all, there are 8 planets, and 8 is greater than 5. Now, this is a reasonable point. On the other hand, it's, it's also clearly unreasonable, isn't it? The number of planets is necessarily greater than five? I mean, that's ridiculous. What's going on here is we're trading between two different interpretations of the opaque context. And this uh, this draws on a very important distinction, the dedicto dire distinction. Uh, essentially, you can take dedicto to mean concerning the word and dire to mean concerning the thing. And an example should help motivate understanding of this. Consider the statement, necessarily the winner of the 2010 UK election was not Ed Miliband. There are two readings of this statement, one true, one false. 
We might interpret it as saying that it was impossible for Ed Miliband to have won the election. On the other hand, we might interpret it as saying that the actual individual who did win, namely David Cameron, could not be Ed Miliband. It's impossible for David Cameron to be Ed Miliband. The first reading here is de dicto. The second is de re. The first reading is false, but the second seems true. I mean, after all, surely David Cameron, that is, the winner of the 2010 British election, surely he could not be Ed Miliband, right? If, if David Cameron were Ed Miliband, he wouldn't be David Cameron, would he? So, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the idea, anyway, is that when we speak de dicto, we're concerned with the description, the winner of the 2010 UK election. And this description doesn't, doesn't necessarily attach to anybody in particular. It could be, could be anyone. But when we speak de re, we're looking through the description to the to the actual object that bears it. We see through the description to the object itself. That's the way I think of the dicto de re. So let's consider this, this distinction in another, in another context. We can also think of it in the context of beliefs. Uh, a famous example from Quine himself is um, Ralph believes that someone is a spy. There are two interpretations here. It might mean that Ralph believes that there are spies in general. Uh, uh, might, Ralph might not have any idea about who is a spy. He just believes that there are spies out there somewhere. This is the de dicto reading. On the other hand, someone might refer to a particular person. There might be a particular individual whom Ralph believes to be a spy. And this is the de re reading. Again, in the case of de dicto, we're concerned just with the word as it is. In the case of the de re reading, we're, we're seeing through the word to a particular individual that it refers to. Uh, so back to modality. Necessarily, the number of planets is greater than five. We could interpret this as being about the planets and as saying that there could not have been less than five planets. This is the de dicto interpretation, and that seems to be false. On the other hand, we could interpret it as saying that the number of planets in and of itself uh, is necessarily greater than five. And that seems to be true. So perhaps there isn't really a problem here. It just depends on whether we take the de dicto or the de re reading. Um, we'll explore this in the next video, but I think that's enough for now. Thanks for watching. I'll uh, see you later. Goodbye.